Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Sandra Barrington with the Sierra Nevada Memorial Hospital Foundation. And when I was working with Sandra on her presentation, I had the chance to look at what the foundation actually contributes and how they're integrated with the hospital. And I was very impressed with the breadth of their work and how they augment the healthcare services of the hospital itself. And so I thank Sandra and her team for that important work. Sandra comes to us with over 20 years experience as a certified fundraising executive and she joined the foundation in 2007. She was promoted to the executive director position in 2022. She is a very active community member serving on multiple boards, um, including the Rotary Club past president and Sierra Harvest. She also is the current president of the Nevada City School District Board of Trustees and we can appreciate the importance of that role as well and she is also a board member of the e on the Economic Resource Council. So with that, I will turn it over to Sandra. Thank you so much, Karen. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me here today. I really appreciate it. What an amazing group of humans. Um, I'm usually not I'm usually not nervous or intimidated, but when I saw who was walking in the door, I was like, I'm a little bit intimidated. But um, so I want to start out by saying and clarifying, I am not a clinical person. My background is in American literature and literary editing and publishing. I was um, I was supposed to be in New York running a publishing house, you know, but life happens. Um, <laughs> You know, I always love asking people, you know, what did you want to be when you grew up? What did you go to school for? And what do you actually do? Because those three things are usually very different things. Um, but I will try to answer clinical questions as much as I can, but I may say, let me get back to you on that one and connect with you via phone or email later. Um, so our mission at Sierra Nevada Memorial Hospital Foundation, the first part of it is the most important part. We touch and save lives every day. That is the most important thing that we do, and we think about that in every project we take on, every program that we do. Are we gonna save a life with this program? Are we gonna help people in our community with their health care with this program? And that's really the bottom line. We do that through philanthropy, we do that through volunteerism, we do that through outreach, we do that through um, the programs that we run and making sure our hospital has state-of-the-art technology and um, the best facilities that we possibly can. But it all goes back to, are we saving people's lives? Are we making people's health care better? Um, and today I'm going to take you on a journey of a few things. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about why a nonprofit hospital is a nonprofit hospital. Uh, we'll talk about the programs and services that the foundation runs, the programs and the services of the hospital. I'll talk about physician recruitment. I know you guys specifically wanted to know about integrative medicine, so I'll talk a little bit about how that works um, at various levels of our different programs. We'll talk a little bit about what's next for the hospital and healthcare, and definitely time for questions. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing what questions you have. I love rumors, so if you let me know what the rumors are in the community, um, I love hearing those, because those are always fun. So at the Hospital Foundation, we, um, we're a small but mighty team, but we do run a handful of programs, and one of the most important programs I think that we run is the Alzheimer's Outreach Program. So if you know anybody in the community, a caregiver that is struggling caring for a loved one, we have a licensed clinical social worker who's a case manager that can work one-on-one -on -one with families. Her name's Judy Kautz. She is a lovely human. Uh, we also have Linda Eichelman who runs our caregiver empowerment series. And caregivers can come to a workshop and uh, we do it a couple times a year and they can learn about things like what legally do I need to put together for my family? How do I take the keys away when that time comes? You know, a lot of really hard topics, but really the goal is to empower the caregivers to be able to deal with the 24-7. Um, we also offer respite care along with that. We do have um, respite vouchers, so if someone needs to utilize one source or um, helping hands down in Penn Valley or bring in a professional caregiver, because the challenges of caregiving, you know, you need to take a break and the caregiver needs to learn how to care for themselves. So that is one of my favorite programs that we run. My uncle had Lewy Bodies Dementia and I saw what it did to my aunt and our family. Um, 
it was very difficult to be a part of, but having that support system is so important. So one of my goals is to build the capacity of that program. We also run a falls prevention program. Has anyone here been to our falls prevention summit that we have? Yeah, saw a hand. Um, we have about 300 people at Twin Cities Church, and we teach people like, how to not fall, but how, what happens if you fall? What do you do after you fall? Because a lot of times a fall can be a real decline in someone's life. If you break a hip, um, things like that, you end up in skilled nursing, and going through a major trauma like that can really turn someone into a decline. So we have a falls prevention coordinator that goes around the community, does presentations like this, you know, things like, you know, watch out where those area rugs are, make sure you have the handle bars in certain places in your house, um, make sure your cat's not trying to trip you because they like to hang out around your feet. And we also are expanding the program this year and we are starting balance classes. So uh, Holly Grimaldi Flores is our false prevention coordinator. She became a certified balance instructor. And along with Nancy Chandler and Jan Arbuckle, they're gonna start teaching certified balance classes. So that's a fun expansion of the program this year. Uh, we also run a comfort cuisine program that is for our cancer patients in the cancer center. Nutritious meals that caregivers and our patients can take home with them or the nurses could heat up while they're having their infusion or sometimes you're there for four or five hours a day and you know having a nice warm meal. So they cook every Thursday in a commercial kitchen and those meals are frozen in the cancer center. And um, that's, as far as I know, it's a very unique program. Most cancer centers don't do something like that but we have a dedicated group, of, um, dedicated group of volunteers that are cooking every Thursday, and they, um, I wanna put it together a cookbook for that because their recipes are pretty good. The mac and cheese, I think, is the most popular one. <laughs> it's pretty good. Because the calorie needs of a cancer patient are very different. Um, if you're on a diet, I do not recommend eating those, um, but they, um, they do quite a good job. We also run a small program called Read Me a Story, and this program's been headed up by Dr. Sarah Warner um, for many, many years and we provide books to children in um, well child checkups when you go to see your pediatrician from six months to five years. And we're in clinics all over the county, um, some parts of uh, North Placer and um, also um, some parts of Truckee. Uh, so it's not uh, exclusive to Nevada County, but when you come in with your, with your child, you'll get a book to take home and encouraging parents to read to their child, which some of us take for granted because it's just part of our normal routine, but not all families do that. Um, so early childhood literacy is part of health. Health is a big word. It means a lot of things and health literacy is very important as well. And then that connection between parent and child in that moment where you're reading with them. We also encourage um, in our educational material to limit screen time and try to coach parents on that as well. So those are some of our programs that we do. Um, technology is a very important part, part of what we raise money for, making sure our hospital has the most up-to-date technology that's um, ap appropriate for our hospital. Um, recently, we revamped almost the entire surgery department with brand new equipment. And um, it's, you know, it's definitely for patients too, but sometimes we think about what do we need to do for physician recruitment? What do we need to do for staff retention? You know, because these young kids coming out of med school and, and nursing school, they want the bells and whistles. And so they're gonna go to the hospital that has the bells and whistles, and we wanna have as much of that as possible. We also focus on capital and facilities and making sure that, um, you know, the building was built in 1958, most of it. Uh, it needs a lot of work. <laughs> There's seismic challenges, and um, it's an older building. So over the years, we've definitely had to upgrade some things. We did a transformation of the emergency department most recently. We raised $2 million for that. Um, we've raised money to um, build the Diagnostic Imaging Center. We raised $1.2 million for that back in the early 2000s. Um, the foundation was really instrumental, instrumental in making sure that we had a cancer center in this community. And that was a huge project in the 90s to build that outpatient center and the cancer center, which I think the cancer center is our shining star in this community. Um, when we think about what projects we're gonna raise money for, we always think about direct patient care improvements. How is this gonna benefit patients? And so that's how we vet our projects. What are we gonna focus on? The hospital has a lot of needs. Over the next 10, 15 years, the hospital probably has over $300 million worth of needs. So we have to say, where are we gonna focus our time and attention? And um, right now we're focusing on our intensive care unit. That definitely benefits the patients directly. We have an amazing intensive care unit. 
uh, 10 beds. They have um, needed some investments for a long time, so that's going to be one of our focuses. And we're always looking at innovations. What can we do to innovate? What can we do um, to you know, think bigger and dream and have a vision? Because that's one of the bonuses you get to do in philanthropy is you get to dream. You get to say, what if? And then they're like, okay, Sandra, go find the money. That's the hardest part. But you, know, you get to say, like, if we had the money, what could we do? And um, that's my favorite part. So the Hospital Foundation incorporated in 1984, making that this year our 40th anniversary. <laughs> and um, been going through a lot of history things and reading a lot of stories and meeting with people. And I still think it's fascinating that in 40 years, this foundation has only had three executive directors and I am one of them. So you might remember Pamela Comstock, she was the first professional executive director. And then of course, Kimberly Parker, who was with us for a little over 20 years. Um, so I always think that's fascinating. Uh, but we've done a lot of things over the years, and this year you'll hear, if you are on our email list or get our newsletter, there'll be things in the paper. We're really going to be talking about the stories of impact of how philanthropy has really made a difference to our hospital and our healthcare community. So I hope you'll come along that journey with us and pay attention to those stories, because um, it's going to be a pretty exciting year for us. So this is a little bit about what we do by the numbers. On average, each year we raise about 1.5 million. Um, this year, thanks to a very generous um, gift from someone's estate planning, very thoughtful estate planning, we have actually raised um, over $2 million this year, which is um, rare for us, but estate planning definitely helps with that. <laughs> um, when you get surprise million dollar gifts, um, that is always lovely. So, um, so this year is gonna be above average for us. <laughs> And um, typically we have about a 3% return on investment to the hospital. A lot of people ask, how are you funded? How do you, you, know, how do you fund your operating? So the hospital does pay for our operating, um, but we have an agreement with them that we will st send back two times our operating. So the goal is $2 on a return on investment, but we typically end up around three. And um, last year we funded about $1.6 million in projects. A lot of that was for our surgery department. And our staff is small but mighty as far as hospital foundations go. We have five full-time, three part-time, and then we have four program staff that are on contract. Um, one of those program staff I did not mention, because her mom's here today, so I need to mention it. Uh, we have a social outreach program, and Anastasia Knight is our social outreach coordinator, and that program works with isolated seniors and helps them, um, people who are depressed, who are having a hard time, who um, just really need that extra support and helps navigate them to resources. And that's one of our program staff that we have that I didn't mention before. And we have a very large board. We have 21 board members. I have 21 bosses, that's how I think about it. Um, but they're all wonderful, engaged people, um, really incredible members of this community. Um, you would recognize a lot of the names for sure. So, enough about the hospital foundation, we'll talk about the hospital. So a little snapshot about the hospital. Um, I do have some information over on this table. One of them is a fact sheet about the hospital. It's a quick one pager that kind of talks about the services and what we do. But 104 beds. We are um, considered a small rural hospital, but a 104 bed hospital. Our emergency department, is pretty incredible. We actually see more people in our emergency department than some of the emergency departments in Sacramento. We have 35,000 patient visits on average a year into our emergency department. It's very, very busy. They also have one of the top patient satisfaction scores in the Dignity Health System. Um, so even though they are busy, the patients are satisfied with the care that they're getting. So. Um, we love seeing those patient satisfaction scores. The emergency department is 21 beds. We did do a transformation of it a couple years ago where we added extra beds, and we added some crisis support beds to help the mental health crisis in our community and help our staff manage that better. Cardiac and cardiac rehab, we do about 30,000 cardiac and cardiac rehab visits per year. That's not individual people, that's the number of times they come in the door. Um, we have about 500 babies born per year in our family birth center. Um, that's gone up a little bit, especially now in the last couple of years, the anesthesiologists have started doing epidurals. So now the volume has gone up at our hospital. Uh, when I had my baby there, they did not do epidurals, but we made it through. Um, our cancer center sees about 20,000 patient visits a year. As some of you may know, if you're going through cancer treatment, you might come every day for four weeks, six weeks, 
so all of those individual visits, but they're managing 20,000 visits per year. The hospital has 800 employees. Um, we're the largest employer in Nevada County. And the, I think the payroll every month at the hospital is over a million dollars. And about 75% of the employees actually live in this community. Only a, a small percentage um, commute in and out. So you can imagine the economic multiplier on that monthly payroll. <laughs> So a huge economic driver of this community is our hospital. Um, we also have 100 active medical staff, all board certified in their field. And we are a locally governed nonprofit hospital. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. They see the dignity name. You see a corporate name on a building and you think they're owned. We are not owned. We are an independent affiliate of Dignity Health. And we do have a local board. Um, Bernadette Sylvester has been on our hospital board before, and her husband Ed is currently on the board and on the board of the foundation. And so you'll see a lot of uh, very familiar names on there. Allison Lehman, she's the CEO of our county. She sits on the hospital board. So they are a governing board with local control. And if we have questions at the end, I know people sometimes want to know more about that structure, but happy to answer that. So the hospital specialties, of course, the emergency department, we do have an amazing mammography department. If you've been in for your mammogram, I hope so. Our Women's Imaging Center is incredible. I had my mammogram recently. They called me back in one hour to tell me it was all clear. I was pretty surprised about that. Wasn't expecting it that fast. <laughs> uh, we have advanced diagnostics. We have two MRIs. We have two CT scanners, um, multiple opportunities to get an X-ray. <laughs> so lots of diagnostics happening in Echo Lab. Of course, our cancer center and in uh, ambul or our ambulatory treatment center, which is upstairs. It's sometimes called an infusion center. Some people refer to it as the ATC. Uh, we have a home care services. Some people don't know that. When you leave the hospital, we have our own home care. So if you're discharged from our hospital, you will probably be put on Sierra Nevada home care. But also, if you're having services done out of the community, like you're having a surgery or something done out of the community, you can request for Sierra Nevada home care to be your home care. But if you're having, let's say, a surgery at UC Davis or Sutter or something like that, of course, they're going to push their own home care services. But you can actually request that um, if you wanted a local home care service. We do both inpatient and outpatient surgery. Uh, outpatient surgery at the hospital, but some people are familiar with the outpatient surgery center on um, Sierra College. The hospital is a part investor in that. Uh, the hospital owns 51% of that. The rest is owned by another business and then physician owned as well. So they share the responsibilities in that. Pulmonary rehab, family birth center, and then we have a really great wound care and hyperbaric medicine that is on Sierra College Drive. So that is a quick overview of hospital services. And some recent awards and achievements, since someone gave me a microphone, I'm gonna toot our horn for a little bit. Uh, the biggest one that recently happened, uh, LeapFrog, which is a national watchdog group, um, very, probably one of the most prominent watchdog groups for hospitals across the country, recently gave the hospital an A rating for patient safety and quality. It's the first time we've had an A rating. We've had a lot of Bs. We've never had an A. And a lot of that is there's about 30 metrics that go into that that they measure. One is um, how many days you've gone without a central line bloodstream infection. We've gone over 1,200 days now without a central line bloodstream infection. How many days you've gone without um, a C. diff infection and things like that. They're looking at um, harm events and whatnot. So we did get that A rating, which is very important, and we're very proud of that. You can actually go onto the LeapFrog website, and you can pull up a map to see what the ratings are of other hospitals in the region. And I won't name names, but some of them have Cs. I'll just say. So you might want to look at that. <laughs> I didn't put the map on here, but some of them have Cs. Um, you'll see a lot of A's, and that's the Dignity Hospitals and the Kaiser Hospitals prim primarily. Um, we do have a nationally accredited uh, award-winning stroke center. Um, if you have a stroke in this community, you will be rushed to our hospital because we are a nationally accredited stroke center. A lot of protocols think that go into that, um, but they say with stroke, time is brain. So if someone's having symptoms, you know, call 911. They will be on an MRI in no time. Um, and if they qualify, there's that clot-busting drug um, if they meet those protocols. We do a lot of work around substance use disorder. Um, so we have received the um, opioid care honor roll for our performance there and focusing on supporting those with substance use disorder. Like I said, um, many days without a central line bloodstream infection. 
um, a UTI, number of days since onsite of C. diff. So those are the measurements that we really look at. Um, the hospital manages um, in a format called high reliability organizing. Every single morning, the leaders and the managers are on a huddle talking about what the safety issues might be, and then there's an afternoon huddle as, uh, the same um, to make sure that those safety issues are being addressed properly, and there's a whole process and protocol for that. So every single morning, first thing, leadership's on, and we're like, what's going on? What are the issues? It could be from, we don't like the new bedpan company that we're getting it from, to someone put in a wrong medication order. So it runs the gamut of what those safety issues might be. So we did receive, because we have that A rating, we qualified for additional awards from LeapFrog. And we were named the top rural hospital by LeapFrog the only hospital in California to receive this award, and only 15 hospitals across the country received this award. <laughs> so we are very proud of that. Um, a lot of that has to do with the patient safety and quality metrics that we meet. It means that our hospital here is in the top 1% of hospitals in the country. And for, for because of all of those safety measures that we meet. And that, um, Dr. Neely's been our CEO for a little over a year now, and that is um, his main focus, is making sure that we are a zero harm event hospital. It happens, healthcare happens, things happen at hospitals, but our goal is to be a zero harm event hospital. And the patient and quality committee um, is very, very focused on that. So we are very proud of this award. If you come to the hospital, the banners are everywhere. <laughs> I have one hanging up in my office. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about community benefit because people always ask me, like, well, what makes a hospital nonprofit? Like, what, what goes into that? And I could go through the whole history of the nuns coming from Ireland, but I don't think we have time for that. Uh, but mo most of the healthcare in, in our country started from religious organizations, started with nonprofit organizations. Healthcare was not meant to be for profit. It never was. That changed at some point. We could talk about Nixon and Henry Kaiser, but again, we don't have time for that either. Um, in my personal opinion, healthcare should always be not for profit. People should be not for profit. Um, but community benefit is how we are judged on how we maintain our nonprofit status. Are we supporting the community? Are we helping people? Is whatever minuscule profits we earn, are they going back into the community? Um, so we look at things like improving access, it's one of the things I look at when we work on projects. Are we increasing access to health? That's what we need to be doing. We need to be increasing access, making sure it's fair, making sure it's equitable. Um, enhancing public health, we work very close with the county on a lot of topics. Um, educating people on healthcare, and um, you know, part of what you need to do is relieve the burden on the government, which sometimes they put back on us. But hmm, try not to put my personal commentary into this, it's hard. Um, so again, you know, community health improvement services, you know, we look at, you know, what are we giving back uh, as far as cash money? What are we giving back to the community as far as in-kind contributions? You know, we look at patient financial assistance, um, what we do with the unreimbursed cost of care from Medicaid, um, well, Medi-Cal in California, and uh, Medicare. A lot of people are really surprised to learn that Medicare actually only um, reimburses at about 80% of the charges. So every time we have an inpatient in the hospital that's Medicare, we lose about $6,000. Um, um, Medi-Cal's Medi a little bit better payer, um, but our commercial insurance at the hospital is actually only around 13, 14%. Last month, it was only 10% of our payer mix was commercial. So it's really hard to run a business that way, but we try very hard, um, and it's a very financially well-managed hospital, I have to say. So I don't expect you guys to read all of this, but um, we'll go through it. So these are the legal requirements to be a nonprofit hospital. It's probably one of those, the most scrutinized nonprofit uh, industries in this country is nonprofit hospitals. So we have to accept everyone in our emergency room, no matter their ability to pay. We treat everybody. Um, we have to have a community board, which we talked about, an amazing community board. We're very lucky with how um, engaged our community is in this hospital. We always say you can't have a community hospital or you can't have a thriving community without a thriving community hospital. Um, we have to have open medical staff policies and um, 
you know, hospital care for everyone, regardless of their ability to pay, we have to be able to accept public programs. Um, any money that the hospital earns has to go back into the facilities. That's just normal nonprofit business, but it has to go back into improving patient care in the facilities um, or training or education or research. We do some clinical trials, um, but not a ton of research at our hospital. And um, for those who are unable to afford it, we do provide that free cost of care. So this is one I definitely don't expect anyone to read, but congratulations if you can. Congratulations. But this is the number I love at the bottom. This is last year. Our community benefit supported 60,000 people in our service area. And the service area is about 100,000. So community benefit programs touch 60% of our service area, which is pretty incredible. And, um, you know, if you add in the uncompensated cost of care, community benefit from our hospital back into the community is around $30 million a year. Of, of what we put back into the community and support people with their health care. So in some of those programs that count towards that, one is substance use navigation. That's a huge challenge in this community. I think we all know that. And you know, this community is working towards a no wrong door policy. If someone shows up in our emergency department and they want help, we're going to help them. And we have people. Um, that's one thing that healthcare doesn't really reimburse back for is those case managers, those navigators, the people who are helping people. Medi-Cal is working towards that with the new Cal-AIM programs, being able to you know, reimburse for patient navigation. Um, but right now, it's just, it's free. It's the right thing to do, so we do it. A lot of focus around substance use navigation, making sure there's Narcan out in the community, making sure people are connected to medicated assisted treatment, where they can go into MAP programs, so that's been a huge focus um, of the community as a whole, especially the hospital. We do have a collaboration with Hospitality House for a recuperative care program. If we have any homeless people who are being unhoused people who are being discharged back into the community, we want to make sure they have a safe place to stay. Um, there was a long time where we were putting people up in hotel rooms and going to meet them and making sure they had their medication and that they were taking care of themselves. But this collaboration was created many years ago with Hospitality House. So they can have the wraparound services too, there for them 24 seven. So not only are they being able to recover from their medical trauma or whatever happened, they have people there that are gonna um, support them in other ways in their life too. Uh, we have patient navigators in a lot of different ways. Uh, one is in the cancer center. We actually have a, 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 a oncology nurse navigator. We also have a new, someone who focuses on nutrition. And you know, I always say, you know, what you eat is the most important health care you're going to give yourself. You know, so if we can change this next generation to, uh, to value fresh, local, healthy food, if we can change our community in that direction and working with local farmers and eating the local food, you know, it's really what you put in your body. So the nutrition therapy is so important on many levels. Um, and we have patient navigators that are really help people just get onto insurance. Or if you come into the emergency department and you're using the emergency department like a primary care, let's help you get you know, back to Western Sierra, which is your home, or back to Chapaday, and connect it back to your primary care. Um, so we have navigators that do that as well. The crisis stabilization unit that is on the hospital campus, that is to support the mental health needs of our community, that is a collaboration with the county behavioral health. And we were almost the first one in California to have one, but Santa Barbara opened theirs the day before we did. But we got close, we got close. Um, so that's really important. People can directly admit to that. They don't have to go through the emergency department, but it is a building next to the emergency department and uh, with behavioral health staff in there to support anyone going through a mental health crisis. Um, on, I mentioned oncology nurse navigators. That is a very important part. There is so much that happens in a cancer journey and you want to know how to take care of the whole person. And that's really what the Cancer Center focus on. We focus on nutrition therapy. You know, is acupuncture going to help this patient? Like, what is chiropractic? Is, you know, what are all the things that might help this patient um, thrive through their journey? So that is the focus of the, the nurse navigator. And I mentioned our Alzheimer's outreach program. So all of those count towards those community benefit dollars that I mentioned, that 30 million. But those are some of the programs that um, we do because it's the right thing to do. So I get asked a lot about physician recruitment. And um, we've had a lot of successes lately, but it's hard, I have to admit. Like, recruiting to a rural community is really, really hard. In general, physician recruitment is hard because not a lot of people are going into medical school anymore. 
It is um, coming out of school with a essentially mortgage load of debt <laughs> is not really where people want to be anymore. Um, and this generation seems to think they can just like put some things on YouTube and make six figures a year. I'm not sure where that came from. But um, you know, people just aren't going into medicine like they used to. So recruiting across the country as a nation, there is a healthcare workforce shortage. It is not just a Sierra Nevada, Grass Valley, rural problem. Um, but we have had some successes in primary care. Um, Dr. Myra Hicks is at the Dignity Health Medical Group. She also works in the urgent care, the Dignity Health Urgent Care. So many of you guys remember the Yuba Docs drama. Who remembers the Yuba Docs drama? Oh, yeah, everybody. Oh, my gosh. Whew, can't believe how many phone calls I took about that. Um, we were able to retain urgent care in the community, which is really, really great. So Dignity Health Urgent Care is on Margaret Lane, 107 Margaret Lane. So that is available to you. You can call in advance and say, I need to come in for something. Um, you can show up. Um, Dr. Hicks is there. Roger Hicks is still there. And um, Myra also takes patients on for primary care at the Dignity Health Medical Group. And that's the building that is 280 Sierra College across from the fire station there. So um, Dr. Garcia is a new primary care physician that was recruited into the medical group. And uh, we also have some really great um, physician assistants, or sometimes they're referred to as advanced practice providers. I highly recommend if you can get into an advanced practice provider, don't be afraid of that. Don't be like, oh, nope, I need the full-blown doctor. Um, an advanced practice provider can do really everything that a physician can do. They just work under the um, realm of that physician and the oversight of that physician. But we've had a lot of luck recruiting advanced practice providers, and that is helping to fill the gaps in primary care. We are about 14 primary care physicians short in this community. And on average, one primary care physician in a rural community can support about 2,500 patients. They can have a patient load of that big. So you gain one, great. You lose one, not great. So constantly recruiting for primary care. Um, we've also had some success in OBGYN. Dr. McDonald's office is wonderful. I've been there myself. That is also in 280 Sierra College. She has an advanced practice provider, Rebecca, who's really great. I absolutely love her. She also does fire dancing, so you've probably seen her at, um, <laughs> you've seen her at, you know, you go down to like summer nights or Cornish Christmas and those people that are like throwing the fireballs around. I learned she also does that. Um, so we have a, had a lot of luck. If you have someone who's like, oh, I can't find a primary care, please call Dignity Health Medical Group. They do have openings. Um, I also have heard that Dr. Pritchett's office and Bouchier have some openings and with their advanced practice provider. Um, Chapaday and Western Sierra are always taking new patients, but they have long wait times. But they will get you in when they can. But I think it's like maybe three weeks to get a physician over at Chapaday or Western Sierra. Um, so, like I said, those are the ones that are supporting taking new patients. And these are our recruitment priorities, obviously cardiology. Dr. Ryan Smith's amazing, but he's only one human. <laughs> so, um, he's really great, but we definitely are, we're always recruiting for cardiology. And we fill those gaps with um, what's called locum physicians or temporary physicians. So someone might sign on for a six month, oh, I'll be here for six months, I'll be here for three months. Um, so we are filling those gaps, but constantly recruiting for cardiology. We know that's a huge need. And then general surgery has been a really big focus. Uh, we have a great orp orthopedic group, great orthopedic surgeries, but general surgery um, we have been needing. Um, if you remember Dr. Waterbrook, he is a great surgeon, uh, but he is on a three-year mission in Africa, uh, which is incredible, um, but we were really sad to see him go, but we're glad he's doing that work. So we are recruiting for that. We recently signed Dr. Khan. He, um, I've heard good things, have not met him yet. Um, but again, we use the locum temporary physicians to cover the call for general and emergency surgery. Um, and again, our recruitment priority with primary care is come one, come all. And these are some of our recruitment strategies. We do a lot of work around recruitment strategies. And I say we, I really mean the hospital. I'm minusculely involved in all of this, and the foundation is minusculely involved in that. It's really the work of the hospital. So we did start the Sierra Nevada Family Medicine Residency Program. And a residency program is the extra years after medical school that physicians train in their specialty. 
So um, the foundation, through grants and community fundraising, we raised about $1.2 million to help start that program. And our first two residents in that program started this year, and we actually have match day for our next two. March 15th is match day. So we'll find out who our next two that are going to start in the program um, in a little bit, and eventually we'll have six at a time in that program. And they um, work primarily out of Chapa Day with Dr. Glenn Gukin, who's the lead on that. And uh, they do rotations throughout the community and different specialties. So it's a very full scope residency program. And the strategy with that is if they train here, they'll stay here. You know, we get them in, we show them how great we are, we wine and dine them, we get the kids involved in sports activities, we find the spouse a job, make sure that they're happy. Because that is one of the biggest challenges, honestly, in physician recruitment. If you can't, if the spouse isn't recruited along with it, if they're not happy, if they can't find what they need in the community, I mean, I've taken spouses out to horse farms. I've taken, you know, people all around to the daycares that I know, um, because you have to recruit the spouse as much as you recruit the physician. So a lot of times it's, it's not the doctor that's saying no, it's the family that's like, no. Um, so we do a lot of work on that as well. Um, but gra graduate medical education is a big priority for us to expand that. So we really want to expand the family medicine residency program. We're also working on um, a surgical residency program and expanding into surgical residencies. So more specialties as we grow that residency program. We do recruitment retreats where we look at, okay, who are those third year residents who are about to go into full-blown medicine, maybe start their own practice or want to come into a medical group. We bring them up here, we wine and dine them. It usually costs about $100,000 to recruit one physician. That's the recruitment costs on recruiting a physician. But these recruitment retreats are so cost effective. You know, Definitely doesn't cost $100,000 to put on a recruitment retreat. And you bring them all here at one time. You show them how great our community is. You show them all the facilities that we have. And that's been really successful. That's how we got Dr. Garcia. Um, we do get support from Dignity Health. It's one of the shared services the hospital has the advantage of taking um, as an affiliate um, of the system. So they do have recruitment support that goes into that marketing and outreach and, and whatnot. Um, and then, like I said, the temporary physicians, the locum physicians. We work on recruiting them to help fill the gaps until we can get permanent physicians into spots. So what is next on the horizon for the hospital and healthcare? Uh, one project we've been working on for a long time, it was appropriation funding from Diane Feinstein's office, um, was for a mobile medical clinic. So we have uh, in the works, being built right now, a two-room primary care mobile medical clinic. It'll look just like a big fancy RV, but when you step in it, it'll be like you're just at a physician's office. It's gonna have x-ray and ultrasound, um, and it'll go around the community to different places, and the Dignity Health Medical Group is recruiting um, people into that. Um, and uh, believe it or not, there are a lot of physicians coming out of medical school who like this clinic model, this mobile clinic model. They enjoy it. You're out in the community, you're in different places every day. Um, you know, so it'll have a couple days a week in our community, and it'll actually go up and down the North State, so it's gonna benefit the entire North State. Um, and I can't wait to parade it around Sacramento in the capital. It's gonna have a big Dignity Health Sierra Nevada logo on it. Very excited about that. Um, like I said, our residency programs, those are gonna be expanding. You'll start to see um, this community become more of a teaching community. And again, with the goal, if they train here, they will stay here. Uh, we do have some seismic updates that have to happen within the hospital, the 2030 seismic requirements. Like I said, the building was built in 1958, this one part of it, and it's really within our family birth center. So we'll see some upgrades to our family birth center. Radiation oncology, our cancer center, is the, one of the most important things we can invest in in this community. Um, we are gonna be working on a project down the road for a new linear accelerator and just making sure that that cancer center stays state of the art and we have the right workforce in there and we can keep people close to home for their care so they're not having to go out of the area for care. I put a question mark next to robotic surgery. I really want robotic surgery. It's so cool. There's this thing called a Da Vinci robot. It's amazing. Yeah, you're all nodding your heads. Yeah. Um, but we know if we're going to recruit physicians and if we're going to start this, re this surgical residency, we need a robotic surgery. So that is definitely something. There's a business plan in the works. We're talking more seriously about. Um, so I think that would be really cool. And that's all I have. <laughs> And 
and I am open for questions. Yes, Valerie. Integrative medicine. Yes. Is that something you see coming, being more involved in that? Yeah, I definitely think there's more of an appetite for holistic care and for, um, some people call it complementary medicine. We see it mostly in our cancer center. That has been in action for many, many years. Um, but I definitely see it more with the primary care providers and everyone really looking at holistic care and bringing in um, what we've traditionally called allied medical professionals, you know, the acupuncturists, the naturopaths, um, Dr. Weiswasser comes to mind, you know, what does this person need holistically? So I definitely see more of that happening. We see it mainly in nutrition therapy um, within the healthcare setting, within the actual traditional healthcare setting. You did not mention two parts of the hospital that always impressed me. Number one was the diabetic training. So you talked about the nutrition, but like my husband became diabetic and went through that course, and that was so fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want, and then the other was the cardio training, you know, the cardio unit. Oh yeah, cardiac rehab um, is really incredible. It's such a great community there. It, it's like this little tiny gym, um, but the people in there are incredible. So if you've had a cardiac trauma, you will be referred to cardiac rehab, and it is a nationally accredited program, um, really amazing staff. Pretty much everything in that um, facility has been funded by community donations. So we have really great equipment in there, and we just funded the upgrade of their telemetry system. So when you're in phase one, like you've recently had a heart attack or a cardiac trauma, they will have you all strapped up to everything while you're on that treadmill or that bike, so they're keeping track of your rhythms. And then the, card the cardiologist can also see that with this new system. So if there's any changes from day to day, from session to session, from your visit with the cardiologist, they can see that right away and be able to address those changes. Yeah, that's a great question. So Chapaday and Western Sierra, and then actually Sierra family as well, they're all federally qualified health clinics. So they are managed kind of under a different, I guess, bucket of healthcare, if you want to call it. Um, but they're more primary care, so that's their focus. They also, uh, Chapaday does dental care. They have a re different reimbursement model. They have different things that they can do. Um, but we definitely work with the Chapaday patients. We actually collaborated on the residency program. So the, our residents work out of Chapaday as the continuity clinic for that program. Um, so we do work really closely with Western Sierra and Chapaday and Sierra family. Um, it's an important part, you know, making sure, like I mentioned earlier, you know, if someone is coming in and is a high utilizer of our emergency department, but they're a Chapaday patient, making sure they're getting back to their medical home, which is Chapaday, for example. Yes. How do you coordinate, or do you coordinate, in this community there are so many nonprofits, <laughs> and it's one danger that you have these little single unit groups that don't know what the other groups are doing, so people might even fall through the cracks or not get. Do you coordinate with some of the other nonprofits in this area, like even one source caregivers and things like that? Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of different groups, and that's one thing I noticed when I took over this role as executive director. I started going to all these meetings, and I was like, oh, we were just in a room together talking about this topic, and we were just in a room together talking about this topic. And so bringing people more together under one roof, that's happening a lot with FREED and um, the, um, the ADRC programs that are going on. Um, we also have the Elder Care Provider Coalition who um, educates and, and helps to keep the um, elder care providers you know, in the loop, our falls prevention program. So everyone's doing the things, but uh, we also have overarching the Nevada County Health Collaborative, and that is spearheaded by County Public Behavioral Health, and we meet regularly um, as healthcare providers to talk about what the issues are in the community and, and what we need. Um, but there is quite a bit of crossover that we're working on streamlining. Can you tell me a little bit more about your in-home health care services, what that looks like, and how and when to access it? Yeah. So um, home care is, our home care with the hospital is, um, is typically after uh, an inpatient situation. So for our home care, it's not, it's not like a partners in care or a comfort keepers where anyone can call them and say, hey, we need some extra support in the home. Our home care for Sierra Nevada is specific to inpatients that have been discharged and need that extra support, or they've had an outpatient surgery or something like that. Does that answer your question, kind of? Um, more or less, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, 
かくなかったって。<笑><笑> Actually, I have two completely separate questions.、Okay. So, the, the, the first one is you mentioned the nutrition program. What's and eating locally, that kind of stuff, tying into that?、Um, we, we recent, my husband and I recently had、um, an event last late summer where、um, he actually needed to spend the night in the hospital. He's totally fine. It's all, it's all, he got great care. But I'm not going to lie to you, the food was so. like. So there's s u c k so that's the food. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and he had this, he had to have like a tube down his temporarily, and they brought him food, but they didn't bring like a straw with the, like, and, and then I said, oh, can we get a straw? Oh, that'll be a couple of hours, ma'am. And I like went down to the cafeteria. Like that little cafeteria that's downstairs. I'm like, can I have a straw, please? And I went right back upstairs. But it, I was wondering if there's going to be further link to actual, the actual hospital food services for the patients. Because it's, it's kind of、yes. like pull up the Cisco truck and. No, no, definitely.、Um, that is something we are working on. And I'm glad you brought it up because it is a big focus of mine. But hospital food's interesting. You know, if you're on a low, a low sodium diet, or you know, maybe you are prepping for surgery, you're maybe just having some broth. Yeah, it's、um, unless you're in the family birth center, that's the only time. After I had my baby, they brought me this beautiful meal. It was great.、Um, but you know, a lot of times it's you know, food for specific diets. You know, it's low fat, it's low sodium, it's none of the fun stuff.、Um, but we did recently, one of my, my pet projects was putting in a vegetable garden on the hospital campus.、Um, so we have a nine bed vegetable garden, we have volunteers that work in it. Right now we have, it's winter crop, but we have like some broccoli and cauliflower and、um, cabbage and things like that. We had so many tomatoes this summer.、Um, so we're working on ways to integrate that into the hospital cafeteria. Hospitals have a lot of bureaucracy, who knew?、Um, <laughs> So much red tape. And apparently, getting a fresh organic tomato onto a hospital patient's plate is very, very challenging. <laughs> But we are working towards that to where we have our own food being grown that is in the cafe. Right now, we're taking that and rounding with the employees, and we have baskets in the cafeteria for our visitors and whatnot to take that food.、Um, we hope to get to the point where we have so much and expand on that that we're like donating it to IMF and the food bank. and And the homeless people that live on the back part of the property can come and take it, you know? But we want to get to that point with it, but we know it's something that needs to be improved, for sure. Completely unrelated.、Um, given election season, we just mentioned it earlier. So, Proposition 1、um, is it's, it, it's a good thing and it's not such a good thing.、Um, I was wondering, is the hospital, or maybe you don't know. Okay. <coughs> Supposedly, the California Hospital Foundation group, what do、uh, <coughs> you call them? All the hospitals. Association. Thank you, association.、Yeah. Um, does, does support it, but, but for rural communities like ours, there, there's, definitely, there's definitely a downside because of how the money、um, Is being, if it does pass, there's, there's a big change in how the money is being forced to be spent.、Okay. I'll have to look into that and get back to you because I'm not familiar with that and I haven't heard it talked about. A lot of times the hospital doesn't take a stance on things. Dignity or Common Spirit Corporate may, but a lot of times the hospital won't take a stance on it, especially if it's a local issue.、Yeah. Well, it's California wide, it's, it's an overhaul of the.、Um, The, M, the one that was passed in 2007, MH something. Mental oh, the Mental Health Services Act. Thank you. Yes, I am familiar with the changes. Thank you for jogging my memory. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Mental Health Services Act changes,、um, keeping a close eye on that one, because they're moving from funding prevention, intervention, and education, which is what some of our programs do, like the social outreach program, to funding housing. Which is, we all know is a huge need, right? Like, no one can deny that. Housing is a huge need. But we need all of it. And actually, additional cl-、uh, clinics and beds for、um, you know, those who need to be housed with severe mental 
mental issues. So it's, 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 it's a toss of the coin because the hospital potentially could benefit greatly from this because the, you mentioned how many yeah. emergency room patients there are. Yeah, the, the way the hospital benefits from that, if there are more beds for mental health patients, someone who's 5150 or, or whatnot, is we can get them out of our hospital faster. We had an emergency department patient, um, for example, who was in our emergency department for seven days with a severe, severe mental health challenge. GVPD was involved. We worked closely with them on things. Um, you know, but we had an employee who was injured, so we had to have a CT scan you know, type injury. Um, and so it is a huge challenge in our emergency department. And I would imagine that healthcare, especially in California, would support something like that. Because the challenge is there's nowhere to put someone who has those challenges. You know, you have to wait for a bed to open up in Napa or whatnot. So yeah, I think it's prop one, you said. Yeah. Okay, I will remember that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah Valerie? Oh, sorry, okay. You talked about the uh, high number of emergency room calls, and I was one of those who used to frequent Yuba docs if I was not feeling well, okay? And then when Yuba docs, instead of trying to get into the doctor and all this. Mm -hmm. So when they shut down, did that have an impact that caused the increase? Okay. That Well, that definitely caused an increase. We're seeing... Um, there was an immediate increase when we saw the closure of that, but now that we um, have opened up the Dignity Health Urgent Care, that's 107 Margaret Lane, um, we're definitely seeing uh, a little bit of a decline in that. But we had a really high um, COVID, RSV, pneumonia, you know, flu season, and the hospital census at one point, you know, we were up in the 90s where we typically average around 60. You know, today I think we're at 74 today. You know, so we had a, we had a pretty high, you know. Uh, flu season there. It seems to be calming down. <laughs> I think we had some questions over here. I've, I've been neglecting this side of the room. So, yes. It's kind of a question, kind of a comment. So moving here um, from Southern California two and a half years ago, trying to find a doctor in this area, uh, I have to say my husband and I gave up and have gone down the hill. So seeing doctors that will accept new patients is really it's, it's encouraging, uh, and I'm wondering if there are any other resources for people like me who come into the community. Um, I, you know, I did all the um, looking at reviews and trying to find the doctors. Aaron McDonald stands out. I found them. Oh, great! Oh, now there's a few patients. So, any suggestions on how to find um, quality health care for people coming into the community? Yeah, I have to say that's not something we do very well is communicate to the newcomers on to like how to access services. I always tell people if you have a neighbor or a friend or somebody, have them call me. I'm very happy to take those phone calls. You can give out my business cards. I'm very happy to help. One of the things that we do at the foundation is help navigate people to services. They'll call us. We'll have our volunteers or donors or someone call us and say, hey, you know, how do I get to XYZ? And um, we may not always know the answer, but a lot of times we know the person who knows the answer. <laughs> um, but people can always call me. But I do have to say, you know, looking at some of those bigger um, um, you know, medical groups like the Dignity Health Medical Group or Sierra Care Physicians, you know, always calling them first is always um, a good idea, but I know it is, it is challenging. Yeah, and there's not like, I think 211 might be a good resource, but I don't know how much we educate them. We could probably do a better job educating them because it changes every day too. Yeah. Okay. Do you do anything with the realtors? They know who's new. Yeah, we do work with the Association of Realtors. We make sure they have our updated fact sheets. Um, that they're familiar with the current list because they're the ones that really know who's coming into the community. So we do communicate with the Association of Realtors quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, purple shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get yours today. Um, yeah, I heard from uh, our president um, that you have changed your emergency room um, procedure recently. I, my, I went with my husband five years ago, uh, which he turned, you know, turned out he had an inside emergency surgery and everything. But we waited a long time to get it that one. So what is the new process? Yeah, so part of the transformation that um, we did in the emergency department was to change the, the way things are triaged. Instead of just like waiting in the waiting room to you know get things going, we actually have um, people right up front in um, uh, oh gosh, I forget the actual term for it, but there's the little windows up front and someone can register you right away and they can actually do like your 
blood check and get some labs done and do things before you actually have to go back to see a physician, because a lot of times people don't have to go all the way into the emergency department and, be, and beyond those doors. You know, you can, we have these rooms set up, they're almost like oh, rapid treatment rooms is what they're called, jog my memory there. Um, like if you just need a couple stitches and be on your way, you know, they're set up to do that way. So it, it, the door to doctor time is what we judge, you know, the door to doctor time um, is faster. So that was the goal with changing the way patients were um, triaged. So the, the ones that are there that are like, really acute and need to be seen, can be seen right away, obviously. But also the people who are coming in with maybe some minor things can be seen faster too. Um, but you might have noticed if you've been there that the waiting room's a little smaller. And so we also have people waiting like in our cafeteria. Um, so it, we did have to, because it is you know a smaller hospital and an older building, so we did have to um, give up some waiting room space to be able to accommodate the new um, rapid treatment rooms and the triage process. That is a great question. I would hope so. Um, it's not an actual robot doing the surgery. I just want to clarify that. It's not. <laughs> but, you know, the, the doctor has control over, you know, what's happening in there, and there's a big fancy screen and, you know. Um, but that is a good question. Um, I would hope so. We're exploring all of that. My sister had hip surgery and by robot, but they placed her incorrectly on, I would call the bed or whatever it is. And when the robot cut, they cut in the wrong spot and she never healed. Oh man. Yeah, the, the, what you're supposed to do in a surger, surgery environment, and this is part of you know, the high reliability organizing and patient safety, is there's supposed to be a pause before you even do anything. And every single person in the room, no matter who you are, physician, environmental services, I don't care if you're changing the garbage can, if something looks wrong, everyone gets an opportunity in that pause to say, this doesn't look right. Um, so that should be part of that process before a surgery happens. Um, sometimes people skip over that, unfortunately, but that's an important part of your healthcare, and you can say that anytime. She didn't have an opportunity, she was under anesthesia, but if you feel like something's wrong, say, hey, I, I need a timeout, and that's part of the protocol at our hospital. Anyone can call for a timeout at any time. Um, like I said, even if it's environmental services and they're in like mopping the floors, if they see something wrong with the patient care, they can go to a nurse and say, like, we need to do a timeout with this patient and double check everything. So that's what should have happened in that case. Um, but yeah. So we're learning more about robotics. That's why you're number one in leapfrog. Yes, that's why we are the top row hospital. Yeah. I'm going to go to this question next. Hey, great. Um, I'm interested in knowing if you have in your budget earmarked for improving the IT my chart system. Mm. <laughs> uh, it's a very frustrating system and you know, data in, data out, but it's it's underutilized because it doesn't seem to work very well. And I just wanted to know if you're contributing uh, budget money towards that uh, to help not only interface with clients mm -hmm. um, and other outside uh, specialists yeah. um, and how that's working in your opinion or not. My personal opinion, yes. healthcare is so far behind the times when it comes to apps and technology. And um, I mean, one of my first projects I worked on when I got here in 2007 was an electronic health record program, a community-wide electronic health record program. This is 2007. We should have been well far ahead of that. Um, so healthcare in general and technology is behind the times. Um, and I find that app very frustrating as well. I'm like, I just want to message my doctor in a secure setting. And a lot of it comes from the HIPAA laws and everyone being so careful that something doesn't violate a HIPAA law. Um, so it is something that I message to leadership regularly. Um, and we do know, I don't, I don't know if there's specifically a budget dollar amount that's being focused on um, at any level, but I, that's a good question. Like, are they investing more? in that because they need to. 
it should be so easy to get online and find out. You know, like, like Quest, if you use Quest Lab, they have a great app. It's easy to schedule an appointment. I can find out what my lab was before my doctor even tells me. <laughs> a lot of times I know, and I'm Googling my systems, I'm self-diagnosing. <laughs> like, oh, I'm dying, but no, you're fine. <laughs> but it, it, I, I agree with you, it's very archaic when you see where we're at in the world with technology. Healthcare is very behind. Question, um, any plans for help with long-term COVID care? Mm -hmm. um, I do get this question quite a bit. Can you repeat the question? Um, any plans for help with a long COVID care? Long COVID care, that is um, something. The county does have um, a support group. I think it's a Zoom support group where people meet online regularly if, if they're having long COVID challenges. That's the only thing that I know about as far as, um, as, far as that. We do have you know, pulmonary rehab um, and good pulmonologists. So you know, I think there's support in the medical community, but the only thing I know specifically about is a support group um, that the county runs that's on the county's website. Yeah, yeah, I definitely have seen that with um, a few people. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes? Um, Dignity Health, I think, is Catholic, right? Yes, and no. So <laughs> my question is, does their uh, affiliation with you have any impact on the reproductive services that you provide? Great question. So um, I'm going to go high level first. OK. so. Um, the structure of, um, of the system, I think a lot of people have questions about. So we have um, Common Spirit Corporate, who is the national corporate entity. And then we have the Dignity Health brand, and we have the Catholic Health Initiatives brand. And I do this with Catholic Health Initiatives because they're mostly in the East and the South. And then Dignity Health is mostly in the West. You might remember that originally the hospital was affiliated with Catholic Health um, Health, Catholic Healthcare West was the original affiliation. We were the first hospital to affiliate with that system. And the reason people affiliate is because you can't survive without the shared services and without the benefits of affiliation. Um, if we were going to stand alone and have our own lawyers and our own HR and our own, um, you know, billing services and all of that, we wouldn't survive. We would be upside down. We would be like every other rural hospital and probably closing. You have to affiliate to be able to survive. The only unicorn is Marshall Hospital in Placerville, if you're familiar with Marshall. I talk to their foundation person quite a bit. I call them a unicorn because they are not affiliated and they are not a district hospital. Um, but they actually have a large commercial payer system because they have a lot of Kaiser payers in that. Um, and they have their own, like, they're more of a medical center. Um, so I call them a unicorn. So they're one of the only rural hospitals that is unaffiliated. Um, but under that structure, um, Sierra Nevada falls into this bucket of dignity community cares because we are a non-religious hospital. We, are, we have spiritual care. We have a chapel. We have spiritual care. We have people who can, from any denomination that can come into the hospital and see you if you need it. Um, our director of mission integration is a chaplain by trade. Um, but we are non-religious. Um, so that does change how we can do certain procedures. And I, I know just a little bit about how it works. We were talking about that earlier today. Um, but, um, you know, there's certain things we, we can do within that dignity, community, cares, non-religious bucket that some of the other Catholic hospitals can't do. But I can find out more about that and get back to you because it came up earlier too. Yeah. yeah. So that's also connected with choosing to end your life because you have a terminal I, my husband had a situation where he wanted to do that and found it extraordinarily difficult in his community to get any, his doctor would not sign the paper even though he had said that he was doing it because he was affiliated with the hospital. So, I'm interested. so I, I would also be interested in knowing what the connection is between the fact that it's a dignity system hospital in some in any way and the unwillingness of that's a great question. I would love to know more about what, um, uh, what essentially is the, the hospital and local physicians take on uh, the right to die, um, you know, in, in California. 
I would love to know more about that as well. I've never been asked that question, what the hospitals and our local physicians take is on that. I only know one person in our community that's been able to do it. I'm not sure who his physician was, um, but um, I would love to learn more about that. I don't know. I will find out more about that, because it would be interesting to know if there is a specific policy that people have to follow or philosophy. I would like to change that. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you so much. I have to take Nancy's last question. Oh, it wasn't a question, really. I just said the last time I was in the room, um, I had a really inspiring experience, and I thought you were going to So I came in, and I was in the bed Story. Yes. <laughs> no, the last time I was in the emergency room, um, I had such a great experience. It was really inspiring because I was in a bed number one with a curtain, and there was someone on the other side, and then there was another curtain and a third person. And the fir third person came in um, having had some horrifying heart experience. And a lovely physician came in and he was asked, he was elderly, he was asking, what is going on? And she took the time, very lovingly, to explain to him how the heart worked and how what he was experiencing related to the function of the heart. And I, I just, I applauded. I, I, I don't think anybody knew what that was for, but it was the most beautiful experience of, of caring concern for a patient. And I just wanted to share that. Thank you. A lot of people know our motto is Hello Human Kindness. It's not just a motto. We try to live that kindness every day, so thank you. Um, but also on the flip side of that, if you know of, of an experience that hasn't been good, the hospital wants to know about that too because we want to be able to fix things. We love to hear the good stories, but the leadership also wants to hear, you know, where can we improve and where are the opportunities to, as they call it, you know, close the holes in the Swiss cheese. You know, where are policies and procedures not working? So we want to hear the good and the bad, so please share your stories with us, and thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Sandra.